setting one. Well, you didn't have to. to I'll just I'll just find the hook. Right? Yeah, I I uh, don't know, and I frankly don't care. No, because when you say yeah. I use this routine, they people oh okay that's fine. You know I use this package. Boom, people are happy. Well, it's just that Moodin presented it as though it's really impactful, so I pay attention to which type of okay. presentation. Okay. Well, Levan, Jamovi is using Levan. Levan mimics M+. And they have four types of standardization in M+. So, yeah. Simultaneously. So, you, I guess you could go and run it in M plus and see if the numbers are different. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Okay, good. Me, I don't really... I know that when I've run this in M plus and Amos, the numbers are the same. So, I'm confident. Right. While you... If you've created it, then you have a whole bunch of choices. Obviously, you want a missing value method. Fortunately, in our case, there is no missing met data. But if there were, you would have the choice of exclude the cases with it, it, even just one missing value. And that could be a lot of people in a big survey or a big test. Because almost everybody ends up skipping something. So that could be very dangerous, but you would be confident that you're, ans you're analyzing people with complete data. The full information maximum likelihood, or FIML, is a maximum likelihood estimation system that says, well, let's give the empty cells a value that retains the mean, the standard deviation, the covariance and correlation or correlation of this variable with itself beforehand. Every variable has a mean, every variable has a standard deviation, and a covariance with all the other items that exists when you remove the missing values. So we let's get that number. Let's put in numbers in the missing spaces that try to keep those things exactly the same, or as close as possible. That's what full information maximum likelihood is doing. I have suspicions not about the calculations, not about um, the accuracy of the number that's filled in. I have suspicions about the meaning of it if you have a lot of missing data. Little and Rubin say, impute missing values if they are small. And they define small as 5% missing. FIML will work with 50% missing. But as a real world researcher, I do not believe I can guess what someone would have answered based on just half their answers. I don't believe, I don't trust that. Because the estimation method is trying to keep the variance, the correlation, the mean and the standard deviation of the variable the same as it was before you put in the missing values. It's actually not trying to estimate what that person who didn't answer the question would have said if they had paid attention or someone had said, oh, you, you have to do page two also, right? We're not actually trying with these estimation methods to actually guess what they would have answered. We're actually trying to keep the variable the same in relation to all other variables at the same time. That's all the estimation method does. And I'm happy to let it do that if I know that missing is less than 10%. If it's more than 10%, I don't trust the method. 
because the method is not about guessing what the person would have said. It's about trying to keep, maximize the likelihood of the start value being correct. Because that's what maximum likelihood does. So, yes, you can ignore the missing, run the model, and you could run it again with list-wise excluded. The question is, which one is right? I would trust this more, but I like to use full data for people who only miss a little. So I would, pre-analysis, I would exclude people with more than 10% missing. I just say, thank you for playing, but I don't trust what I'm going to fill you in with. But if you gave me 93% of the data, I would get, I would take a risk on the 7%. So it's not a question of, I don't trust the statistics. The problem is, I don't trust my ability to interpret the psychological truth of the person who only gives me 87% of the data. Now, I may be too conservative in setting at 10%. I've already doubled what Lissell and Rubin said, 5% in their book on missing value analysis. So, I leave it to you to decide whether it's virtuous to guess what people would have answered based on less than 90% of the data. But you have to make a decision here. There is no missing data, so it doesn't matter which button you choose. Constraints. This is the point that Maxim brought up. Traditionally, we set the first indicator uh, with the scale factor 1, the seed value. The other alternative is to say, force the factor, the meat, the factor here, to have a variance of 1. That everything creates 1. Maxime will probably have a good reason for that. I stay away from it, partly because the professor that taught me factor analysis said we do this. <laughs> and I, my gut says it ought to be the same in the end, but I don't know that it's the same. And uh, this I'm used to seeing. I'm used to seeing item number one had a value of one because I set it at one. And then after standardization, I know that it's 71. But there's no estimating what the error was. It can't, there can't be any error because we set it to 1. If you set the factor variances to 1, this would no longer be constrained, and you would get maybe hugely different answers. Conventionally, this is the most conventional, most common probably because it was easier mathematically in the past. I've seen no, I haven't read anything that says, has tested the two different approaches to say one is superior. Um, the fact that Jamobi gives you both suggests that both have some legitimacy, but I really don't know about this one. This is the one I've do, been taught and I have used, and it still produces a standardized value for everything. That, was that faster than your computers? 709, so it's the same number. 787, 814, 640, 805, 719. And now I have, because I didn't constrain the item, I have a confidence interval and a Z value and so on. So at the item level, it's not going to change anything. If it doesn't change anything, then it which one do you like to do? Maxine, your 
you made a comment to me about the downstream positive effect of doing this was something to do with factor scores? Yeah, because in this case the factor scores will have uh, mean, zero mean and... Uh, Standard so deviation of what? One, yes, for your sample. So it creates factor scores and that are set scores. And the second reason because your items are, let's say, have uh, more symmetrical in, uh, input into the model because if you have constraint, one item constraint, what item should be constrained? Right. Yeah, okay. but you already asked. Okay, so those are basically if your reviewer is reading it, or examiner is reading it, oh, okay, you have a logic. So, Maxine's given two reasons to prefer this solution, and I've given a really bad reason for preferring this solution because this is the way I've always done it, right? Tradition. Doesn't mean it's right, and it looks like the answer is the same. Okay? So, if the answer is the same, then toss a coin and choose one. What did we get? So, you get, for every item, this is the factor, this is the items that belong in the factor, this is the estimate, the standard error, the lower and upper bound of the 95% confidence interval, because you want to know it does not cross zero, it doesn't go suddenly below zero, in which case we don't know if it's positive or negative, that we don't want, because then it would be statistically not significant, and it would mean this item doesn't do anything for the factor, which is not what you want. You would throw it out. And there's your standardized values, seven, seven, eight, six, eight, seven. Oh, nice big, big numbers. Seven, seven, eight, seven and eight, five, six, six, six. So that's uh, number one is the weaker one. SQ, 6 and 7, 7, 7, 8, 8, 7, 6, 6, almost 7, 6, 6, yeah. all these numbers are really strong compared like we were reading yesterday in EFA. You were looking for big, strong numbers to make sure that, and it carries on. Sevens and eights, sixes, sixes. There's a four eight, so it's almost not five. What is the minimum? Zero point five. Zero. The minimum would be zero. Okay, but if it's zero, then it won't even be statistically significant. No, I understand the four. The acceptable statistical. All right. Remember what we're trying to do is not use a rule of thumb to decide if an item belongs to a factor or not. What we're actually going to do is look at the fit quality to decide if the model as a whole is close to the data. So, how weak can an item be and still give you good fit to the data? If an item is only explained 0.20, it's more noise than signal. And a lot of people would say, well, let's throw that away. The rule of thumb is around 30, 40. But actually, in this model, you can see there's almost nothing below 50. If you could get your items up 50, 60, 70 all consistently, it's highly likely your factors are explaining more variance than noise which means you probably fit the data, okay? Your goal is to have a simple, interpretable structure that explains, that matches the data. And you get that with strong loadings. Weak loadings say, I'm not doing very much. I'm here, but I'm not doing very much, you know? I'm just sitting on the beach, you know, and I'm not doing any work. Hi, guys, you're doing all the work. I might be a nice decoration and I wish I'd kick you, but maybe you, my model would be better if I just sent you home. Does that make sense? Hi. Uh, 
So this standard estimate is the factor loading of variable on that factor. But yes. What is estimate there? I can understand. Actually. Sorry. What estimate on the column of estimate? Ah. Yes. Yes. There are two values: the raw value and then the standardized value. Okay, like in a regression equation, there's B, and then we standardize it, and you get beta. The standardized is a proportion of variance, percentage of standard deviation. So, for every standard deviation increase in CE, you will get 0.71 increase of standard deviation in the item. The estimate says, for every increase of one, you will get almost one unit increase in item one. So this is, the estimate is at the raw scale value. The standardized is at the standard deviation level. So it's a conversion. There's a standard error. There's your interval. This is the transformation to Z, and this leads to a standard deviation value. And in the report, we use sorry in the report. No article. In the article, all I always report the standardized value, and I make a note: standardized loading. Frankly, because then you can compare them because they're on the same scale. Because some of these scale factors have different numbers of items. And uh, this is, I don't know, I guess that in this version, it's an increase of one unit from strongly disagreed to mostly disagree, or from slightly agreed to moderately agreed, that would be an increase of one, you would get 0.984 increase in that item. 1.1 1, 1 .1 unit increase. In terms of standard deviations, this is the kind of increase you get. So in terms of how do you report things and how do you understand things, I like to use standardized simply because I can then interpret it independent of the scale. I can now interpret it in terms of a common metric, standard deviation. So it's like, more like an effect size. For every standard deviation increase, I get that much standard deviation increase. For every unit increase, I get that much unit increase. So it's the difference between B and beta. Because it's a regression equation. Okay? What else did I choose? I've chosen all of these, but sometimes you don't give a damn, so you don't need them. So let's have a look at what, what it gave us. So, there's your factor covariances. Okay, so this is the covariance of CE with CE. It must be one. The CE with <coughs> PE, SF, and so you can see that CE and IG almost zero mm -hmm. and in fact the standardized value is zero and it's statistically not significant which means I could tell in the next instruction I could say don't let CE correlate with IG make that zero because this is equivalent to zero Can we do it in Java? Sorry? Is it possible to do it in Java? I haven't figured out how. I know how to, we can do it in oh. Lavan, in R, but we can't do it. I don't know how to do it in Jamovi, so maybe one of you smart people will figure it out. But I don't, I don't see an option. Um, anyway, so this tells you everything is positively correlated, but this one is close to zero. How does PE correlate? Ooh, PE is negative with bad, but it's statistically significant. So you, you would say, well, I have to keep it, but it's 
small and negative. Beyond chance, but small and negative. So the more you think PE, the less you think BD and ignore it. Assessment is not bad, and I don't ignore it because I enjoy it. It kind of makes sense. A little weird, you know, like, do you need counseling or therapy? You, you like going to tests? Are you, are you abnormal or something? You know, that may be a way of counseling someone if you think enjoying tests is a bad thing. But if it turns out people who enjoy tests don't think they're bad, don't ignore them, score more than people who hate tests and think they're evil, then you might want to have use that as a way of counseling people coming up to exams and tests. Look, you might actually enjoy this. Instead of saying, I know you're going to hate this, well, you might want to change the message to, look guys, this is a test, you might enjoy this. Some of you like to find out what you don't know. Some of you will need, will, will be surprised by how much you do know. You might want to turn it around as a way of counseling people to how to cope with assessments. But that's just a top of the head hypothesis that maybe you could investigate in a further study once you have this correlational data. But that's how I try to use this kind of data to think, well, what does it mean, and do I believe that? And then it carries on through the other correlations. So you get all of the correlations, and generally, you would be expected to report the correlation matrix of all... So that's the loading. Sorry, it went backwards. You'd be expected to report the correlation matrix. Um, most people are happy with just the standardized value. They don't want to see all this other stuff. And if you follow American Psychological Association, two decimal places. So this is one, two, three, four, five decimals. Really? 63.2 is different to 63.3? 63.217 is different to 63.21, you know, like, come on. 63 is almost 64 and 62 at the same time, so why would you care beyond the second decimal? False precision. Anyway, that's the factor intercepts. Notice they're all set at 1 because that was the model we chose. The residual estimates. This is, this is how much I have not explained. This is the leftover. 50, 30, 50, 40, 50, 50, you know, like, I've explained somewhere around half of the variability in how people respond to these 33 items with these eight factors. For the most part, though, so there are people who go, well, that's not very much. But actually, in education, if you can explain sometimes as little as 10% of the variance, you actually have a lever to know this is what we should do about it. We should do something. We might be able to make a small difference. But now we've explained, uh, on average, a ballpark something like 50% of the variance. Well, that's a lot, actually. These factors explain the responses. So that's, wow, impressive. That's not nothing, even though the unexplained seems like a lot. In education, it's very difficult to get beyond about 25, 30% explaining variance, okay? And this is in a psychological thing that could be very transitory. They might change in a different situation. I notice it's 11.30, it's coffee break time, so we should just stop. Otherwise, you, I don't want to torture you. This is already enough. Uh, so, a little... Uh, yeah. A little announcement. Today we have a uh, sightseeing tour. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we have a meeting today uh, near the entrance of this building, okay. outdoors, at 7 p.m. 7. 7 p.m. 
and uh, at 7 p.m. will go to the place of excursion and there is no way that we will wait for someone or something like that. At 7 we will meet you, at 7.10 we will go with uh, our kid and so on, okay? Okay. But if it will somehow you will late or something like that, at 7.30 our tour will start from the point uh, at uh, near the Red Square. So I'll put the page with the details of the time of meeting here and of the time and the starting point of excursion near the Red Square. So you can just look here and check. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. So there will be two groups, uh, Russian and English. Uh, ah, excellent. Will be so, okay. so you Russian people can learn something about the city you know nothing about. Коллеги, а как она работает? Да, но ины нет. Start, stop.